I'd like to introduce our speaker who is probably familiar to a lot of you. Elaine Mills is a member of the 2012 Master Gardener class, and she's been growing native plants in her home garden since 2010 and at our Glen Carlin demonstration garden since joining the team of coordinators there in 2017. She has given many talks on native plants which are archived on our website and today's presentation has been prepared in response to feedback from her earlier talks requesting basic information on native garden maintenance practices. Elaine. Thank you very much, Colleen. And thank you to all the master gardeners who are providing support behind the scenes. I also would like to extend a special note of appreciation to our webmaster of the MGNV website, Elena Rodriguez, who went above and beyond helping me get all of the special handouts that I've prepared for you available on our website. So welcome everyone to our first uh, program for the year in sustainable landscaping. Since we're going to be talking about gardening with native plants, I thought it would be nice to have a really quick recap as to why master gardeners recommend the use of native plants in landscaping. First of all, they have many ornamental qualities and they give a sense of place. Uh, our gardens on the East Coast, for example, will be very different from those, say, in uh, dry California or the Southwest. Uh, native plants uh, have adapted over a long period of time to our local soil, water, and climate conditions. And very importantly, they provide support to wildlife, especially our endangered insect pollinators and birds. They'll do that offering nectar and pollen, seeds, fruit, and nuts cover and nesting sites, and food for the insect larvae. You see pictured the a monarch caterpillar there. From 2013 to 2016, uh, researchers from the University of Delaware and the Smithsonian conducted a joint study of residential landscapes in the DC metropolitan area. And they were particularly looking for the prevalence of caterpillars, understanding that they are an essential food component for 96% of our bird species that feed their young caterpillars. And they discovered that the home landscapes that had at least 70% of native plants, particularly those with a large biomass like trees and shrubs, were able to support a large number of caterpillars, which in turn supported birds such as the Carolina chickadee pictured here. And those birds were able to successfully raise a whole new generation of young. Now, the researchers, uh, Desiree Narango, Doug Tellamy, and Peter Mera, uh, remind homeowners that although the formula for an ideal landscape recommends 70% native plants, that still allows homeowners 30% of their favorite benign non-native species. So today we'll be covering basic garden maintenance and I'll be talking about tasks that are appropriate for each of the seasons. As Colleen mentioned, we have a great deal of material to cover. I would like to uh, allow enough time for some questions. So I've prepared a handout that you can follow along with as I go at a fairly good clip. In addition, I'm going to do something a little different, which is to provide PDF of our slides that will be available along with the recording of the class on the website. So you don't need to panic about not having enough time to copy down everything you'd like to on a particular slide. You'll be able to go back and reference that at your leisure. Before we get into the tasks, I just wanted to take a moment to remind you to enjoy the beauty of your garden through the season. And even in this quiet winter time, there are beautiful things to see the texture of bark, the texture of uh, evergreen foliage, silhouettes of trees, seed heads, the fertile fronds of ferns, and the effects of ice and snow. And speaking of ice and snow, that leads us right into uh, the tasks that we'll be considering for winter time, dealing with storm damage and potential salt damage, doing some winter pruning, 
controlling winter weeds and planning for the new growing season and perhaps doing a soil test. Our local conditions here in the Washington DC area are really changing with climate change. Just this week, we had balmy temperatures in the 60s, but we still do occasionally have to deal with heavy snowstorms. And our local extension agent advises us that herbaceous plants and most trees will actually be fine. You can simply remove the excess snow from the limbs and gently lift and shake them. Most of the problems will be seen with damage on evergreens. And of course, this isn't uh, specific just to native plants. But I was glad to learn in an article that she posted on our website that a native plant like Arborvitae might recover with the steps that I show here. This poor plant, unfortunately, uh, didn't recover. I didn't know about the steps at that time. But you can learn about that and uh, other ways to address torn branches in her article that's mentioned uh, at the beginning of your handout. Another issue in winter time is dealing with spray or runoff of dissolved de-icing products. And salt can also be of concern in coastal areas where flooding could bring salt water onto land or areas where there's over application of fertilizers with uh, use on lawns or in agricultural areas. Salt causes major dehydration of plant roots. And if there's continuous exposure, it can actually be carried up through the entire vascular system killing the plant. Damage will be most noticeable on the foliage, especially of evergreen plants. It's referred to as salt burn. Now, we don't have control over the products that are used by various local jurisdictions for treating the roads, but we can perhaps use products that don't contain damaging salt on our driveways and sidewalks. Uh, we could also plant sensitive plants uphill 50 or 60 feet away from paving and try to promote deep root systems to resist damage. You can learn about some of the alternative products in the article from uh, our extension agent, Kirsten Conrad, that's listed on your handout. I was interested to learn whether there were any native plants that were particularly salt tolerant. So I did a survey of 10 lists from university and cooperative extension websites. And I learned that these trees and shrubs are particularly salt tolerant. In addition, uh, grasses, sedges, and rushes, as well as selected forbs can also be somewhat tolerant. And uh, you can always come back and refer to this slide. And in addition, I've created a whole new resource. It's called Best Bets Salt Tolerant Plants, should you uh, wish to consult this further. One of your first winter tasks will be the pruning of your trees. And Virginia Cooperative Extension indicates that our native evergreen trees will seldom need pruning. Of course, you'll want to remove multiple leaders or dead or broken branches as they come up. For most of the native evergreens, the best time to prune is December to February. And they alert uh, us that American holly should definitely not be pruned during its bloom period from April to June. Hemlock and white pine, on the other hand, are actually best pruned from April to June. As far as pruning of our deciduous trees, again, remove any dead or broken branches at any time. For some trees, the timing is not particularly critical, although it could be a good time to handle this task from December to February. They alert us that river birch should really not be pruned beginning in February because of the sap flow period. And I'll be mentioning some other trees that would be pruned after blooming a little later in the year. It, because trees are long lasting, very important uh, structural components in our landscape, I urge you if necessary to consult a certified arborist and you can go to the Trees Are Good site to find such an individual. Now could also be a time to prune some of your native shrubs. Again, any time is appropriate for correcting damage or removing diseased branches. 
The native shrubs that you will be pruning now are shrubs that bloom on what's referred to as new wood. That means those that are going to be blooming on the current season's new growth. And there's a really excellent uh, recording of pruning trees and shrubs in our Master Gardener virtual classroom. And I recommend that you look at, at that to follow the actual technical steps of how to do the pruning. But I've got a couple of general comments about the reason why you would be doing the pruning. First of all, you can encourage new growth. A good example would be with our red twig dogwood. The older stems of this plant are brown and the newer stems are bright red. So you can actually prune out about a third of the older stems, cutting them way down to the ground, as you can see, and this will spur the growth of new red stems. And I'd like to remind you to do what our master gardeners are doing here, wearing protective gloves for hands and wearing uh, protective eyewear when you undertake pruning. Some of our native shrubs can actually tolerate what's referred to as hard pruning. One good example of this is with wild hydrangea pictured there in the foreground. You can actually cut it well down to the ground and it will regrow three to five feet and bloom abundantly as shown here in June. American beauty berry can also be pruned low. You can remove the old canes to rejuvenate it and New Jersey tea also tolerates hard pruning. The shrubs shown here generally require little pruning and high bush blueberry has specialized care. And uh, to give you more information, I have created a table referred to as Native Shrubs to Prune in Winter, a brand new resource available on the website that talks about the 17 native shrubs I've identified that could be pruned during the winter. Another task to be on top of is controlling winter weeds. If you can remove these from your landscape now, they'll be less likely to show up through seeding later on. And just a quick look at some of those that are very common in our area. Purple dead nettle has a heart-shaped leaves that are purple near the top of the stems and green toward the bottom. Henbit is sometimes confused with this because it has similar appearing hooded flowers, but it has a different scalloped rounded leaves. Speedwell uh, spreads as a hairy mass with little blue flowers. Common chickweed you'll see throughout the year with its sprawling stems and flowers. Annual bluegrass is a distinct with its whitish flower head. And hairy bittercress has basal rosettes with erect stems and little cross-shaped white flowers. And unfortunately, they will send up many seeds that just respond uh, to a touch of those little pods. Now, I personally don't use any chemicals to control these weeds. I find that if you get uh, on top of it early in the season, you can use my favorite gardening tool, which is the Hori Hori Soil Knife. It's a wonderful uh, knife about an eight inch long blade with a pointed tip and one side is serrated. It has handy markings uh, along the blade that could help you determine the depth for say planting bulbs. Now this tool and many others are discussed in a wonderful and very entertaining class by my master gardener colleague, Alyssa Ford Morell called Tips, Tricks and Tools, Advice from Master Gardeners. So I encourage you to watch that. One of the enjoyable tasks for uh, winter time is planning for the new growing season. Uh, perhaps you want to reduce your lawn and just use it as an edging around your beds. You might be uh, wanting to consider some alternatives to turf grass. One example might be non-native mini clover that could be used as a pathway between beds. The National Arboretum here in Washington, D.C. is looking at a native grass, poverty oat grass. It's short and drought tolerant, and they think that it might conceivably be a good turf alternative. And many of our sedges are now being tested. They're being grown at the Mount Cuba Center. And interestingly, just this week, Mount Cuba uh, published a report called Carex for the Mid-Atlantic Region. And one portion of that report discusses sedges as possible lawn substitutes. 
I also would like to draw to your attention an upcoming class that Alyssa will be teaching called Case Studies in Lawn Replacement. That will be on April 14. And there are other uh, handy resources that I'm mentioning also about lawn replacements on your handout. You might also be thinking of replacing invasives. And I've created a set of fact sheets on uh, typical invasive plants. It describes the problems that these plants pose and suggests quite a number of alternative native species. And we have no fewer than three uh, different presentations on our website uh, discussing invasive plants and native alternatives. Perhaps you want to be more ambitious and actually add some new garden beds. And for this, I would recommend that you watch uh, this wonderful presentation by my colleague, Amy Crumpton, on sustainable landscaping basics. She describes all the principles from the Landscape for Life curriculum. And if you'd like more uh, inspiration with specific landscape scenarios, I encourage you to check out this presentation that I prepared last year. It discusses different uh, scenarios and gives examples from my own garden. One picture there on the left shows that, as well as other master gardener gardens to demonstrate these principles. In addition, I have a section of the talk that I call Cues to Care. And this gives examples of how you can use certain techniques to make a native garden more acceptable to those who think of landscaping default as lawn, maybe one shade tree, and foundation plants. So you can check those uh, two presentations out on our website. The final task for winter might be to do a soil test. And native plants do not require fertilization the way our lawns or vegetable crops would. They have adapted to our local soil conditions and they work in harmony with soil microbes to get all the nutrients that they need. In fact, some native plants, the grasses in particular, actually prefer uh, what's referred to as lean soil, not overly rich soil. Fertilizing, in fact, can burn plants or make them weak and floppy. So you may want to test before starting a new bed, and you might do that for two reasons. First might be to check the pH of the soil. That's the acidity or alkalinity, particularly if you want to be introducing plants that prefer uh, one condition or the other. And the other reason to check might be for the organic matter content, that is the decomposed material that's been building up in the soil. We have lots of resources on our website that tell you exactly how to collect your soil samples and how to complete the paperwork. And they also explain how you can interpret the results that you get. And of course, you can always check with your local extension agent to uh, have assistance in interpreting any results. Since we talked about plants that might prefer acidity, I'd like to mention that our native trees tend to prefer a soil pH below seven, which is considered neutral. So they prefer the acidic range, the lower uh, end of the scale. Trees are really not compatible with alkaline preferring turf grass. So if you possibly can avoid the use of lime fertilizer on any lawn that you have near tree roots. And ideally you'll be creating wide mulched or planted beds surrounding the trees. So here are examples of some of the trees that prefer a lower range of pH. There are acid loving native shrubs. These are in the Heath family and they prefer a quite a low range anywhere for 4.5 to 6.0. There are other native shrubs that also favor a lower pH below neutral. And on the other hand, there are some native shrubs that actually prefer alkaline conditions. And a wonderful resource to check on the pH that's preferred is listed under the Do a Soil Test, Native Plants for Wildlife Habitat and Conservation Landscaping, lists the preferred pH for most of these plants. Let's move on to spring, where we'll be talking about the care for sedges and grasses, other perennials, 
We'll talk about how to go about selecting new plants to introduce for the plans you might have come up with over the winter and where and how to purchase new plants. Sedges, as I mentioned with the idea of turf replacement, are really coming to the attention of gardeners. They're wonderful replacements for so many of our invasive ground covers, such as liriope. They have wonderful ornamental characteristics and make great ground covers themselves. Now, over the winter, uh, some of them will actually be evergreen, but others will be getting a little tattered. I suggest that you'll be wanting to look out as early as March to give them a little bit of a trim. And with some of them, you can actually just comb or trim out the dead foliage with scissors. This would be for the sedges with narrow foliage, like Pennsylvania sedge or Appalachian sedge. For larger sedges with thick growth, especially the wider foliage leaves, you can actually grab handfuls of the foliage and cut it back with pruners. And examples of this would be plantain leaf sedge or graze sedge. And you can add any of the trimmed material to your compost. If you want to learn more about sedges, you can see a class that I gave on native grasses, sedges, and rushes in our Master Gardener virtual classroom. Grasses are very attractive uh, through the winter time. The seed heads are lovely and they give architectural structure to the garden over the winter. But again, you'll be wanting to cut down those dried stems in the early spring. And you'll cut them down to about four to six inches. You'll see what it looks like over in the photo on the right. You can remove these cut pieces and either use them for mulch or add them to your compost. You'll see regrowth of new shoots first with these cool season grass species and then a little later with these warm season grasses. If you'd like to divide your sedges and grasses to have them multiply through your landscape with the smaller grasses and the sedges, you can fairly easily lift the clumps and cut them into pieces with a knife like the hori hori I mentioned, making sure to keep sufficient roots and you may actually see some offsets that make it easy to separate the plants. This will be a little more challenging with the larger grasses, which have very substantial root systems. You'll have to work a little bit harder to pry the clump out of the ground. And you can use a heavy tool like an ax, hatchet, or shovel to divide that root ball into pieces with roots or you may actually want to instead use one of these tools to remove chunks from around the edges of the root ball. And then you can pot up or replant the divided parts and of course, water them thoroughly. Traditional uh, landscaping recommendations are that we cut down any of the stems of our perennial plants in the fall but I'm going to encourage you to leave the stems of the perennials intact over the winter. Not only will they uh, provide seeds for our wildlife, but they'll have lovely ornamental characteristics. And then in the spring, you'll be able to create habitat for our native stem nesting bees. 30% of our native bees are stem nesters. The way you'll do this is to cut hollow flower stems uh, anywhere from pencil dimension size to larger to varying heights, anywhere from 8 to 24 inches. As fe female bees are emerging, they will start creating nests in the stems. And then new growth of these plants will hide the stem stubble. In the meanwhile, the young bees will be hibernating in the stems, as you see on the right. Uh, this will be through the summer, the fall, and the winter, and then they will emerge as adults next year. So you would want to make sure to leave the cut stems in place well into the second spring. You would see signs that the new young bees had emerged as adults when the little caps of mud or re resin were obviously broken away. Now, Sam Drogi and Alonzo Abugadas, two of our local specialists in bees, remind us that this method of creating habitat is actually preferable to purchasing and using the manufactured bee hotels. The reason for this is with the hotels, you'll have a density of a bee population. This will be attractive to 
uh, predators, uh, for example, cuckoo bees that might want to take over those nests with their own young. And it also encourages the spread of parasites and pathogens. Now on your website, I'm referring you to two great resources. One is a little chart by Heather Holm, a wonderful bee expert that summarizes all of the steps that I've been describing. And there's also a great article from the Xerxes Society. Here are just some of the perennials, those with fairly large stems that would be suitable for stem nesting bees. And these warm season grasses also can serve that purpose as well as these woody shrubs. Another way to provide habitat for our bees, 70% of them are ground nesters, is to retain a few open spots in your garden. Uh, bees are particularly drawn to sunny slopes uh, with loose soil. They will create tunnels underneath the ground with little brood chambers. Uh, that they've supplied with uh, these little nectar and pollen balls. And these particular bees can also use snags, that is standing dead trees, fallen logs, tree stumps, or brush piles for habitat as well. And don't be surprised if you see signs of activity by leafcutter bees. They may slice out small holes from some of your leaves, but this will be uh, simply cosmetic damage, not particularly significant. And you know when you see this that you're providing support to these particular bees. One of your early spring tasks might be to divide perennials. Perhaps you'd like to spread them further around your garden or share them with other gardening friends. Another reason to divide perennials is that they may lose vigor over time, and it could be necessary to divide them every three to five years. Signs that they might need this division are dying out and getting a little woody in the center. The leaves may become smaller and flowers may be less abundant. So spring could be a really good time, particularly for plants that are going to bloom a bit later from mid-June to the fall. You would like to choose preferably a cool and cloudy day to do this that will prevent dehydration of your plants as you're working on them. You can use a shovel and dig four to six inches away from the base of the plant and then let it rest on the shovel as shown here, or you can actually take it to a table as we do at our Master Gardener uh, propagation work parties and do the division there. You can use your hands or varied tools as I show uh, to divide depending on how tenacious the roots are. And be sure to allow a certain number of stems uh, for each section. And then you can transplant them in your garden or pot them up. And in both cases, of course, water them thoroughly. Perennials have different kinds of root systems. And I'd like to go into that a little more carefully here. Some of them, such as bee balm and foam flower, are termed spreaders. And they are going to spread by rhizomes, which are underground stems, or stolons, which are above ground stems. And what you would do would be to slice between the babies, the little plants that spread out from that original parent plant. Other uh, perennials, such as garden phlox and goldenrod, are clumpers. They have fibrous roots, and you'd be able to divide the entire root ball into multiple sections. Still other plants, like alum root and joe pieweed, have what are referred to as woody crowns. And with these, you would want to dig up uh, the entire plant with that main root. And then you would cut it into sections, each of them with a few leaves, and be sure to keep at least a handful of leaves on that original crown with the main root. Still other plants, such as wild indigo and butterfly weed, uh, grow from substantial tap roots. And I really uh, encourage you not to attempt division of these plants. If you'd want more, it's best to go out and, and buy additional plants. Now, I have created a brand new resource for you that describes techniques for dividing and proper times for dividing 53 native perennials. And you'll see the link for that on your handout. We'll talk briefly about dividing ferns 
for clumping ferns, such as Christmas fern, cinnamon fern, and wood ferns, he would dig up the entire plant and identify the circles of fronds that are referred to as crowns. Then you'd cut between those crowns with a clean, sharp garden knife and make sure that each section has a good root mass. As far as spreading ferns, which would be interrupted fern, maidenhair fern, or royal fern, you'll cut segments of the rhizome, making sure that there are fronds attached. And then with all of these examples, replant the sections at the original depth and make sure to water them well until they're reestablished. Now, our next garden task would be selecting appropriate new plants to install based on the plants you might have made over the winter time. Here in Virginia, we're very lucky. We're at the southern end of the range of mid-Atlantic species and the northern end of the range of southeastern species. Here in northern Virginia, we're right along the fall line, so we can take advantage of plants that are native to both the coastal plain and the Piedmont. Now, for those who are attending the talk from the Mid-Atlantic region, you can make use of the tried and true fact sheets on our websites. Uh, and I hope uh, many of you will enjoy referring to the many classes on native plants in our Master Gardener virtual classroom. We've divided them up, uh, native plants by season, by growing condition, and uh, by type. And you can see those, as I mentioned, on the website. For those who are attending from Northern Virginia, I highly recommend referring to the Plant Nova Natives Guide. It's now in its fourth edition. For those attending from other regions of Virginia, check out the Plant Virginia Natives Regional Guides that are appropriate for your particular section of Virginia. For those who are attending from the Southeast, the North Carolina Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox is an outstanding site, and I really recommend that for everyone because it provides excellent information on the use of native plants by wildlife, particularly bees and our Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, and they also have excellent information about a potential toxicity of those plants. So all those links are provided on your handout. When you're selecting plants, I urge you to remember the Master Gardener mantra, right plant, right place, and be sure to match the plant's requirements to the sun and soil moisture conditions you have in particular parts of your garden. And to assist you with this process, you can refer to our best bet suggestion lists. We've also prepared a couple of presentations on native plants for specific conditions. I've given talks on plants for dry and wet conditions. And in April, I'll be giving a talk on native plants for shade. Uh, one concern when selecting plants is potential deer predation. We are becoming more and more aware of how deer overpopulation is severely affecting the forest understory. And unfortunately, they move from there into our home landscapes. No plant is entirely deer proof, but we have found that ferns, grasses, and sedges are generally avoided as are plants that have thorns or prickly or scented leaves. On our website, you can refer to a best bets list, native plants that are rarely damaged by deer. And my master gardener colleague, Kathy Clements, will be giving a talk uh, at the end of April uh, describing strategies for living with deer. People who are just becoming familiar with native plants may not have heard the term dioecious. And most plants uh, actually have flowers with both male and female reproductive parts. But the so-called dioecious species have flowers on separate male and female plants. So it's important to be aware of what those are. These are going to require cross-fertilization with male pollen carried from the male plant to the flowers on the female plants in order for them to fruit. So in your planning, you would need to include at least one male to assure the fruiting of the female plants. Here are the dioecious native trees. 
and there are also dioecious native shrubs. Ideally, you would select these when they're in bloom. You could potentially go to a nursery in the fall. The plants that you see that are fruiting would definitely be female, but plants that are not fruiting are not necessarily male. They just may be young female plants that have not yet flowered and have not yet produced fruit. So uh, perhaps the best time would be in the spring when they're in bloom. And you might want to bring along a garden loop to magnify and make uh, it a little bit easier to compare the flowers. Uh, for ease, I'm showing some close-up examples of what the different male and female flowers look like for three of the most common uh, species in our area. Uh, the male flowers of spice bush will have stamens with a pair of anthers, while the female flowers will have a white-tipped pistil in the center of the flower. With inkberry and winterberry, the male flowers will have fluffy anthers covered with pollen, while the female flowers will have a raised green nub in the center. Native-only nurseries may more clearly identify the sexes of the plants, but if you still can't see clear identifications, one of my Master Gardener colleagues suggests uh, buying multiples. If you buy, say, five plants, the chances are pretty good that you can get a representation of each species. A few more notes on dioecious species. Some species have named male and female cultivars, and a good example of this is with winterberry. Ilex verticillata red sprite is a female plant, and Jim Dandy is a male plant. So you'll want to make sure that the male and female plants you're purchasing are going to bloom at the same time. One male can service uh, multiple female plants and they should be located at least within 40 to 50 feet of each other. I personally plant them side by side as is shown here. Now on your handout, I have listed an article on dioecious plants and a very handy a winterberry pollination chart to help you match those male and female cultivars. Now our native viburnums, arrowwood, maple leaf, possum haw, and black haw are monoecious, but they tend to do their best fruiting when there's cross-pollination between what are referred to as genetic variants. So you'll want to do one of several things. You can either buy your plants from a nursery that grows its shrubs from seed. I was lucky to be able to do that. This is a showing of my arrowwood viburnum, and they bloom profusely and fruit profusely. Another solution might be to purchase straight species shrubs from different growers to get a mix of genetic variants. Or you might buy a straight species plant and a cultivar with the same bloom time. Now, I've been using the terms straight species and cultivars, so let me explain those terms a little more clearly. Straight species refers to the natural form of the plant that you would find in the wild, whereas cultivars are bred in cultivation. They're chosen. They're selected for particular traits. They're manipulated. And this breeding is for human convenience and enjoyment and generally doesn't take the needs of wildlife into consideration. So I am frequently asked, would I recommend straight species or cultivars in a particular case? And my response is that there is a spectrum of levels of support for wildlife with our cultivars. So let me go into more detail on that. Cultivars that are bred for size or disease resistance, according to Doug Tallamy, who is interested in their support for our Lepidoptera, states that these types of cultivars present fewer issues. For example, the Claire Grace cultivar of wild bergamot, bred for uh, mildew resistance, seems to attract an equal number of pollinators. Dwarf size cultivars can be very helpful for those of us who have small gardens. They're going to have the same flowers and the same fruit. Here are just three examples of straight species plants, black chokeberry, fragrant sumac, and Virginia sweet spire, and their corresponding 
dwarf forms. The straight species would range anywhere from about six feet of the black chokeberry uh, to closer to 10 to 12 feet for the others. And then the shorter cultivars would be maybe 18 inches to two or maybe three feet. Now, in a later podcast that I heard with Doug Tellamy speaking, he raised the issue that this dwarf size of plants may be problematic for the feeding of birds. They may, may not feel as comfortable feeding low to the ground when they're used to uh, coming to feed from shrubs of a taller height. So that's something to take into consideration. A major problem for wildlife occurs with changes to the foliage. Uh, a change in the leaf color of the plant reflects a change in chemistry. So the green leaves of the straight species would be filled with chlorophyll and any uh, color change to red leaves means that the chemistry involves anthocyanins. So an example of this would be the straight species arrowwood viburnum and the red feather, feather cultivar. Common nine bark has maybe more cultivars uh, with different colors of foliage than just about any other plant I can think of. Amber Jubilee, Diabolo, and Summer Wine are just a few of them. So the issue here is that the change in the chemistry is going to affect the use of the plant uh, for the caterpillars of butterflies and moths. This young generation of those insects won't be able to feed upon these uh, plants as a host plant. Changes to the flower structure are also problematic. Flowers that have large showy blossoms tend to lack the sexual parts. And in other words, they're sterile. Take a look, for example, at wild hydrangea and the Annabelle cultivar. You can see all the very prominent stamens of the wild hydrangea straight species, whereas the Annabelle cultivar just has the very attractive but sterile flowers. So these are not going to provide nectar and pollen for our pollinators. Purple coneflower is probably the herbaceous plant that is modified more than any other plant in the horticulture trade. The straight species has disc and ray flowers. It's a composite uh, flower. And in this cutaway, you can see how the nectar and pollen are still available in this central portion of the plant. This is from a very helpful uh, report on echinacea from Mount Cuba. The double delight cultivar is beautiful to our eyes, but as you can see in the cutaway, the extra petals have completely replaced the nectaries and the sources of pollen. One final issue with cultivars is that most of them are propagated vegetatively by cloning. That means they're all going to be identical and they're therefore going to lack the genetic variation to make them adaptable to change. On your handout, I give you a link to an article I've written on the topic that goes into much more detail on the studies by Doug Tallamy and Annie White. And it's also a link to the Mount Cuba Center plant trials. There have been trials for many native plants comparing the straight species with a whole range of cultivars, especially with an eye to seeing which ones will still provide uh, support for our wildlife. Another consideration when you're looking to uh, purchase new plants would be the plant type. Uh, container plants, of course, will give you immediate gratification. They have a more substantial root system and larger growth above ground. They range in size for the perennials from quart to gallon. And of course, any shrubs or trees you purchase would be in larger size containers. A smaller size like the quart size is definitely preferred when planting around tree roots so you can dis uh, disturb them as little as possible. And you'll generally be planting about 15 to 36 inches on center, depending on the ultimate mature size of the plants. With container plants, you'll want to be sure to tease apart any of the circling roots. And just a reminder that plastic pots can be a challenge to recycle. Another plant type uh, are plugs. These are seedlings that are grown in separate cells of a tray. And these can be more economical than the uh, container plants, especially when you want to plant very large areas. These are generally planted on 12 inch centers, as you see in the lower photograph, 
and the roots are relatively undisturbed by planting. You simply slip that plug right straight into your planting hole. Now they will take a little bit longer to grow with a, a, an obvious show above ground, but they are focusing on establishing strong root systems underground. Uh, one challenge may be that some of the species you're looking for aren't available in the plug type. Another type would be seeds. Many people have asked me in my earlier talks of whether they might grow native plants from seeds. I have found that you may need to mail order seed and an alert that the seed you would be purchasing might be the ecotype, that is the local type uh, appropriate for uh, another state. You may need to buy large quantities. Sometimes seeds are sold uh, by the pound with the intention of seeding uh, a whole meadow area. You may find that there are more plant mixes rather than individual species that you're looking for. And the prices can uh, be fairly expensive. One option would be to try collecting your own seeds. But uh, an alert, you're going to need to collect them in the proper manner at the proper time. You'll want to label them very carefully so you can recognize what they are when the proper time comes to plant them out. And they may need some special storage to keep them at the proper temperature. Matt Bright from uh, our local Earth Sangha group that does native plant propagation and native plant restoration uh, advises us that it isn't always easy to grow native plants from seeds. They may not be viable for a long period of time, Many of them require what's referred to as cold stratification that simulates the pro process that they'd be going through out in nature. Some of them require special treatment to simulate the process of going through an animal's digestive tract. You would need to prepare the ground very carefully before planting. And in fact, it could actually be easier to start the seeds in pots. Now, if you are ambitious and would like to try doing this, I have some references on your handout. And one of them that would be very helpful, I've taken images from it. It's a webinar called Winter Seed Sowing that goes into all the details of, of how to do this. A resource that I don't refer to on the handout is the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center website. If you look up individual native plants and go down to the bottom of their long description, you can actually see the proper uh, treatment that the seeds need to go through to encourage proper growth. Uh, so when you're getting ready to purchase plants, I encourage you to buy from reputable sellers, especially those that are not going to be treating their plants with neonicotinoids. Buy plants that are appropriate to your particular region local ecotype if possible to help preserve genetic diversity. And you may find that some nurseries will sell plugs and seeds as well as the container plants. Now I've provided on the handout links to the native plant societies for quite a number of states. I understand we have visitors from all the way down in Louisiana, West Virginia and up in Canada. And I apologize, I don't have links for those, but uh, you can try checking with your local um, state plant societies. Do we have any questions now, Colleen? Indeed we do, Elaine. <laughs> the first, the easy one, what do you consider early spring? Uh, early spring could be as early as March for uh, some of the trimming of these sedges and grasses. Our sunny demonstration garden actually begins propagation, the division of perennials in the early weeks of March. A couple of questioners wanted to talk about pH and how difficult is it to change the pH of your soil? And if it's really difficult, would, it be, would a better strategy just be to pick plants that fit your soil as opposed to trying to alter your soil to fit your plants? Yes, the, the latter. It would definitely be best just to see what your garden conditions are and to find plants that are going to match that. Now, if when you do the soil test, your acidity, for example, isn't off by that much, there are different processes that you can go through to alter the soil, but you would need to maybe start doing that a year ahead of time 
and there are sites, I believe the University of Maryland website has some good descriptions, for example, of how to prepare soil should you want to grow the native high bush blueberry. But it's it's a laborious process. And if the, the soil test is off by that much, it may just not be very practical to do that. Mm -hmm. One other option might be to use large containers for those plants where you could manipulate the soil a little more precisely. Good idea. Elaine, do you have any information on discouraging rabbits from your native plantings? I, I don't. I have suffered with uh, rabbit <laughs> predation. One year, I put in quite a number of shrubs, and they were actually biting entire branches off down at the bottom. Oh. Uh, what I can say is that our uh, tried and true fact sheets for all of our native plants include information about which plants are more likely to be damaged by rabbits and deer. So look for those sections of those websites for helpful information. There were a couple questioners who wanted to find male ink berries. I know you said that one strategy is to buy a bigger number of plants and hope you get a male. Are there any other strategies for finding male inkberry plants? I would suggest trying first to see if you can find a local native only nursery. Those nurseries will be very aware of the importance of providing both male and female plants. So that would be the absolute best way to do it. But some of the nurseries will have smaller plants and it's hard to tell if they haven't come into flower, which ones are the males and the females. A question about cultivars with intense blue foliage. Is this problematic for wildlife? Was an example given in the question? I if I had to guess, I would think they were thinking about hydrangeas that are real blue, but I'm not sure. Our native hydrangeas aren't going to have that foliage. It would be the Asian hydrangeas, I guess. I can think of some native plants that tend to have a blue-green foliage. Some of our sedges, for example, are blue-green. And uh, that's, that's just their natural form. Echinacea, for example, the straight species, you have those mauve colored ray uh, petals and they are modified. You'll find them in yellows, oranges, whites. Some of them look almost like uh, ice cream cones. So it's that kind of very advanced manipulation of colors and shapes that is really the most problematic. Interesting question. Do cultivars with altered leaf color ever revert to the original? I guess I'll need to think a little bit about that. Any questions that I'm not able to answer completely, I will be preparing an addendum document that will be sent out to everyone attending the program, all the registrants, and it will also be available on the website. I know that cultivars of non-native plants, some of the shrubs, euonymus, for example, some of the euonymus plants, that uh, have a yellow leaf rather than a green leaf, some of the branches of that will revert back. So that uh, could be a, a, a potential situation, but I'll look a little further into that. Someone asked if there will be resources or information available regarding the impact of climate change on timing of things like pruning and other tasks. Yes, I talk about climate change to a certain extent in a completely separate uh, presentation called Climate Conscious Gardening. In that talk, I go into detail about the changes we're seeing in each of the seasons. One of the most problematic changes is the blurring of the lines between winter and spring. I originally had a slide on this and I just thought it was maybe a little too much. When we begin to get some of these warm temperatures up in the 50s and 60s in the middle of winter instead of the usual 40s. We experience what's referred to as false spring. Some of our plants begin to want to come out. They're beginning to emerge. And this means that the synchronicity between the emergence of the plants and the emergence of the insects, especially our native bees, is really troubled. Also, the migration of birds can be impacted by the change of when fruit is available. So you might want to take a look at that presentation. I have a series on our Master Gardener 
Instagram and Facebook channels, a year long series appearing on Thursdays, where I will be discussing some of the issues that we're facing in our gardens with climate change. I have an example, actually, of a cultivar that did revert to some extent to, to the straight species. I was encouraged by a landscaper quite a few years ago before I knew very much about native plants to plant what's referred to as a ballless sweet gum rather than one with the prickly seed balls. And I later became discouraged with that because that had leaves with rounded lobes rather than the beautiful characteristic mm. pointed lobes. Mm. It didn't have any of the seed heads originally but I have noticed a few branches have actually had the seeds and a few of them have fallen down. So uh, that it definitely can happen. Yeah, nature is stronger than we are. <laughs> yes. One, <laughs> one final last minute question is chartreuse foliage distasteful to caterpillars? Well, some of our plants do uh, naturally have uh, chartreuse foliage. Some of our native sedges have that foliage. I would say if you have a concern about providing support to the larval stage of butterflies and moths, go with the straight species of the shrubs. That's going to be the surest fire way to make sure that you'll be providing that support. One other option would be maybe to have one plant with uh, the straight species and for your own enjoyment of one of the cultivars. Let's move on to summer. We'll be talking briefly about creating container plantings, controlling the height of perennials and deadheading them, doing some summer pruning, dealing with extreme weather, being alert for diseases and pests, and a few final miscellaneous tips. As we're moving to our gardens in the summertime, wanting to enjoy our patios, you might be interested to know that you can actually use native plants in containers. You can uh, plant them with a single species or a combination. You might have uh, entire groups of pots and you could even uh, pot up some small shrubs. The a familiar design formula Thriller, filler, spiller works for native plants as well. Now, an important distinction between using native plants and the plants like annuals that we generally see in our summer pots is these are going to be plants that will need to stay in the pots over a period of time. So there's a whole different way of handling them. This could be an entire talk. I do have the second half of a video that I gave um, a class on small space gardening for pollinators discusses how to use native plants in containers. And the handout also has links to three great sites that discuss very specifically how to use these plants. Audubon at Home, Plant Nova Natives, and now the Homegrown National Park uh, all have great text and charts on how to do this. Some of us get a little frustrated over the summer with plants getting tall and floppy. So here are a few tips to control the height of those perennials. One technique is referred to as pinching. That's where you'll be using your thumb and forefinger, the nails of those fingers, to remove the growing tips and the first set of leaves. Uh, alternately, you can do what's referred to as cutting back by reducing the length of stems by up to a half with your pruning shears. This diagram shows what it's like before and after pinching, and you see those doubled growths. And the same thing occurs when you trim uh, a stem of a perennial further down. This promotes a bushier, more compact plant and prevents flopping and the need for staking. This can be done once or even several times from late spring to summer, but you want to make sure to finish doing this. We usually say the 4th of July is a handy date to remember so that you make sure that you won't be preventing the flowering of the plant. As just one example of this, the fireworks goldenrod will actually grow to four feet for its full height. And by this cutting back technique, I'm able to reduce its height to about two feet. So it makes a really lovely surround for my oak leaf hydrangea. A fantastic resource on this is The Well-Tended Perennial Garden by Tracy DeSabato-Ost. And I have details on that 
mentioned in your handout. A technique that you'll want to use throughout the summer will be deadheading, because unlike the annuals that will bloom all summer long, perennials bloom over a somewhat shorter period. So you can remove the spent leaves periodically by either cutting or pinching. Now, in some cases, this deadheading will actually stimulate rebloom, and that will extend the flowering season in some plants. In other cases, you would simply be doing this deadheading to improve the appearance. For example, with our native hibiscus, each flower only lasts a day, and once they've closed up, the flowers tend to turn somewhat mushy, so it's a good idea to remove those. Uh, same thing, the flower stalks remain and aren't as attractive with the foliage of our iris plants. Now, for both the cutting back and deadheading, I've created a whole new resource of about 50 perennials. And you'll see the, the link to that listed on the handout. Alyssa Ford Morell has a great short video on cutting back perennials as they grow. And there are longer videos on the topic on our Master Gardener website. Another task for summer would be to prune the deciduous trees that you didn't prune in the winter time. Again, you could prune these particular trees anytime if there are, are broken branches. You'll be pruning these after they're flowering from May to July. And you'll definitely avoid pruning after July because the new buds for the next season will begin to set. Now, maple blooms exceedingly early in March in our particular area of Northern Virginia, but you'll want to prune this in the summer to avoid the spring sap flow. Some of these are multi-stemmed plants and some of them can be reduced down to a single trunk to have a more tree-like form. Again, consult a certified arborist and you can refer to that Virginia Cooperative Extension handout on the pruning. We'll also be pruning native shrubs Again, any time to correct damage or remove diseased material. Now, the shrubs you'll be pruning now are the ones that bloom on what's referred to as old wood. That means they formed their buds last year and they'll be blooming this spring. So you'll want to prune them shortly after blooming. And there are two classes taught by our local extension agent, Kirsten Conrad, she's pictured here, and I've given you links to those on your handout. In addition, I'd like to call it your attention to a recording of a class on pruning by Master Gardener Mariah Harris, and she will be giving a reprise of that talk for us uh, through our Master Gardener program toward the middle of February. So look for that if you want details on the exact technique of pruning. But just a few quick notes about this particular category of shrubs. Some of them, like mountain laurel, rhododendron, and azaleas are slow growing, so they'll require less pruning. But be sure to remove the spent flowers of these because they tend to get rather sticky and they'll ad adhere in an unattractive way to the foliage. Spice bush and oak leaf hydrangea similarly require little pruning, and you may want to actually retain the dried flowers of oak leaf hydrangea. They are beautifully set off against the fall foliage. Common yucca is a stemless shrub. It doesn't need any pruning, and in fact, it resents disturbance, so you would simply separate the young offsets. Now, one thing I didn't mention earlier in discussing the native shrubs to prune in winter is that many of our native shrubs sucker. That means that they're actually going to be sending up young shoots. You can see them in green here in the center photograph, right at the base of the original plant. One example of this is Virginia sweet spire. This is a, a picture of my little Henry cultivar. You can trim these new growths away. You can actually stick them in potting soil and water them. They will root uh, fairly readily and you can create in whole entire new shrubs that way. With this particular plant, I simply trimmed away these new shoots at the front because this was close to a pathway, but you can actually allow the remaining shoots to uh, continue to grow and allow the plant to actually spread as a hedge. Here are some more suckering shrubs. 
and all of our native viburnums are suckering. Note that the black haw, the tallest of our native viburnums, can be pruned to grow as a tree. As with a couple of the winter shrubs, some of the summer pruned shrubs can tolerate fairly hard pruning. A coastal dog hobble can be cut to the ground after flowering if you want to rejuvenate it, and it will regrow up to four feet in a year. With common nine bark, you can either prune it after blooming, no later than August, or you could cut it to the ground in winter to rejuvenate it. And I've created a brand new handout for you, native shrubs to prune in summer, and 14 native shrubs are listed on that. Now with uh, climate change, we're dealing with extreme summer weather. We're alternating between drought, heavy rainstorms, and sometimes these stagnant weather patterns will last for quite a while. To address drought, it's a good idea to be monitoring rainfall through the season, and ideally your garden will be receiving one inch of precipitation per week, or you can supplement it with a, a comparable amount of water. I discussed this in detail in that climate conscious gardening video. Trees need 15 to 20 gallons for the first three years of their growth, and shrubs similarly need extra water for the first two years. And a reminder that even established plants, especially our big trees, may need supplemental water if the drought period goes on for an extended period of time. You can find a ways to store extra water with rain barrels or cisterns, and you can possibly modify your watering using these water bags to make sure that water is delivered directly to the roots of young trees. You can use soaker hoses to deliver water directly to those roots and not have it, uh, it be evaporating with overhead watering. On the other extreme, we're now dealing with heavy storms. And if it isn't filtered, the rain will actually be hitting the ground at 25 miles an hour. The more densely our gardens are planted with canopy trees and shrubs underneath, the more we can buffer this impact. And I encourage you to, as much as possible, actually use lower growing plants as your green mulch rather than the brown shredded mulch. Our local forester recommends wood chips over bark mulch. He says that the bark mulch, in his experience, tends to mat during dry periods and can actually be carried away in heavy rainstorms. So the idea is that we're trying to capture and filter as much of the runoff on our properties as possible. We want to prevent chemicals and sediment from being carried into our waterways. A reminder, if you've gone through a period of this extreme weather, be sure not to work on the wet ground. You'll be compacting the soil and damaging its structure. It's important to address ponding issues if you have puddles as large as this, you want to make sure that they are evaporating or being drawn down into the ground within three days. And there are different techniques to address this if it still remains a problem. And one of these might be to install a rain garden. And I've got a great link to a webinar from the Northern Virginia Regional Commission on all the details of how to build a rain garden. During periods of this wet weather, especially with the high humidity and the higher and higher summer evening temperatures that we're experiencing, you may want to be alert for some foliar diseases. I don't notice a lot of diseases on the native plants I grow, but here are a few to look out for. On garden flocks, they sometimes experience powdery mildew, and there are certain cultural practices that can help keep that at bay. One is to space the plants adequately, maybe trim them if they're growing very closely, water early in the day so water isn't uh, kept on the leaves. Watering early also prevents leaf burn with warm sunshine uh, burning water droplets. And of course, if you do experience the mildew, be sure to discard all the deceased debris rather than putting it on your compost pile. In one of our demonstration gardens, we often see leaf blotch on red buckeye. And again, uh, increase airflow, use soaker or drip hoses rather than overhead watering, and discard any fallen infected leaves. Many people are concerned about whether or not to plant a flowering dogwood in their gardens. They've heard about dogwood anthracnose, 
And I just recently learned that there are actually two diseases. The one that's more prevalent in our particular area in the Piedmont and the uh, coastal plain is actually a less destructive disease called spot anthracnose. It's mainly just going to have simple damage to the leaves, but not systemic damage. The systemic damage occurs from dogwood anthracnose, which occurs in plants at higher elevations. But there are certain things you can do to encourage your dogwood to grow well. It's an understory plant, so don't plant it out in the middle of your yard where it's going to have beating hot sun. Plant it in moist, rich, acidic soil. Try to provide some afternoon shade. Maybe have it at the edge of a woodland planting. Use mulch to keep the roots cool and water it during periods of drought to avoid stress. So I've got more information about tree diseases and an article differentiating between the dogwood and the spot anthracnose on your handout. You may also want to keep an eye out for potential pests. Cottony scale is a pest that would actually appear on plants a little earlier in the season, but I'm including it here just uh, for ease of comparison. I understand that maintaining overall plant health can try to keep the, them at bay and you can encourage natural predators such as lady beetles. I was able to handpick these females that showed up on the underside of my winterberry leaves and get that under control without using any chemicals. Aphids uh, tend to appear particularly on oxi and cup plant. And again, you can take advantage of natural predators. Compare the underside of uh, this cup plant leaf, which uh, has abundant aphids and the top surface where this lady beetle has been at work. And you can also knock the aphids off with a water spray. Some folks who grow our native milkweeds are concerned about seeing these uh, colorful bugs on their plants, but be assured they cause minimal damage. And if you dislike them, you can actually hand pick them. Leaf miner is actually a fly but the name refers to the larval stage of the insect that tunnels its way through the leaves of some plants like red columbine. Again, the damage is usually only cosmetic, and if you wish, you can pick off any affected leaves. A few more miscellaneous summertime tips for your native plant garden. Please refrain from spraying for pests, uh, including for mosquitoes. This is going to have a very deleterious effect on our pollinators. You can learn much more about it from articles on our website. They suggest these techniques, monitor for any standing water using dunks with BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. Also check and change the water every few days in your fountains and bird baths. You can wear protective clothing and use repellents. And if you wish to sit outside in the summer, you can use fans to chase the mosquitoes away. As you're sitting outside, perhaps in the evening, enjoying your garden, try as much as possible to limit light pollution. This has an impact on the navigation of migrating birds, uh, the life cycle of insects and plants. And you can keep your insects uh, population protected by using yellow LED bulbs and shielded lighting. And also in a reference to my climate conscious gardening talk, I urge you to avoid peat based products. Peat bogs are non-renewable and harvesting from them releases vast amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. You can try using compost rather than peat in your potting soil mixes. And there are also uh, coconut fiber pots that are available. Moving quickly into fall to finish up our tasks for the year, we'll be looking at dividing spring blooming perennials, planting some spring ephemerals, trees and shrubs, maintaining your perennials through the last weeks of the year and leaving the leaves. We've already talked about the division of plants early in the spring, and these are some plants that you might be dividing now, the ones that would be blooming from spring to mid-June. Doing it now will give these particular plants time to establish their roots before the winter, and you can follow the technique as described for the spring propagation, that is looking for the different root types. 
And uh, here's some examples of those spring blooming native plants. And refer again to that resource on dividing plants. I very clearly show exactly what season these plants can be divided. Some can be divided in either the spring or the fall. And I describe the root types and lots of additional notes. Now would be a good time to plant spring ephemerals. I'm recommending that you plant them from either the corms or rhizomes. And the plants are going to be dormant because they uh, die back uh, in midsummer. Folks who ask about growing them for seed, I want to alert you that even if you can get them to, to put up their foliage, it's going to take many years, sometimes uh, up to seven years before they will flower. It's helpful to use markers to help locate where these plants will be coming up in the spring and plan for other species to fill in the blanks after summer dieback. Here's some examples of popular spring ephemerals, and you can learn about many more of them and more detailed techniques for working with them, both in garden design and planting on a video that I've created. Now is a good time to plant uh, many of our trees and shrubs. And as tempting as it might be to install very large specimens, our local forester, Jim McGlone, encourages us to plant uh, younger plants. They're likely to establish more successfully. For example, I installed a black gum a couple of years ago through the Eco Action Arlington Canopy Restoral Program. It was only about two inches across in circumference and maybe five feet high. Now the trunk measures of four inches across and it's 15 feet high and settling in very well. Whatever uh, format the tree or shrub comes in, whether it's a container plant, whether it's wrapped in uh, burlap or whether it comes as what's referred to as bare root, you'll want to spread out those roots because you want to dig a shallow planting hole about two to three times the width of that root ball. And you'll be looking very carefully for what's referred to as the root flare, the point at which the trunk widens out and you'll see the top of the roots. It's very important to have a, a shallow hole when you start out with, because you want to plant that root flare just above the ground level and you don't want the plant uh, to sink down into the hole. You will refill the hole with unamended soil. You're not going to add any other products to that because you want the roots to settle in, but then grow beyond the hole into the surrounding soil. And I use this optional step of creating a little berm that can help uh, retain water close to the, to the roots to get it a good start. If you're going to mulch, be sure to mulch properly, ideally uh, from end to end of the, the drip line, keep the mulch away from the trunk of the tree and only mulch about two to three inches deep. None of these uh, big deep mulch volcanoes. And there's some great resources on exactly how to go about uh, planting and transplanting trees and shrubs. With our perennials, I encourage you to actually keep the seed heads standing if at all possible, they're going to provide winter interest and of course be uh, used as food or nesting materials for our birds. Three great examples are New York ironweed, Joe pieweed, and field thistle. And you can see the downy material that's perfect for nests. Purple coneflower also has great seeds that attract the goldfinches. And if those stems become a little bit uh, weak, I tend to uh, group them together with a little support that a tomato cage that you see there in the center of the photo. And remember that these stems that you are leaving to stand will serve as habitat for the stem nesting bees in the technique I described for the spring. On the other hand, there may be some perennials that you'll want to cut back because they spread so vigorously by self-seeding. So examples would be black-eyed Susan, white wood aster, and rough stem goldenrod. A technique I use with uh, some perennials is uh, following what I described as the cues to care. I have sun drops, beard tongue, and lyre leaf sage blooming in various sections of my garden. But the plants that are right at the front 
of my garden uh, parallel to a sidewalk where there'll be passers by. I will trim the stems down and I'll let those basal rosettes be used as a winter ground cover. This is a signal that I am maintaining my garden. And if you uh, want to get more tips on cues to care, I provide a link to my video creating a well-layered landscape. And the tips on cues to care begins at 54 minutes of that recording. And my final word of advice is please leave the leaves. Leaves are not litter. If at all possible, let leaves overwinter in place. Uh, you can allow the natural recycling of nutrients. A gradual decay will actually build up organic mat uh, matter in the soil, uh, making it uh, more absorbent, uh, more retentive of moisture. And the trees can then uh, take nutrients back up again in the spring. Uh, leaf litter is also a protective covering for the soil, preventing erosion. And we're now learning more and more how this leaf litter provides important protection for bumblebee queens, the larval stages of butterflies and moths, and fireflies. And of course, if you aren't raking up all these leaves, bagging them and carting them to the curb, and then turning around and purchasing new mulch, you'll be having a savings of time and money. Uh, the handout has a link to a really entertaining recording of a lecture, My Year Playing with Leaf Litter, where a young graduate student describes the effects of removing this leaf litter on insect communities. There is also uh, a great class called Leave the Leaves and Other Beneficial Practices by a master gardener, Nina DeRosa, on the website. She talks about such techniques as running a mower over leaves that gather on your lawn that will provide a natural nutrient supplement. You can use leaves whole or shredded as mulch under shrubs and in flower beds. Be sure, of course, to keep these away from trunks to prevent uh, moisture building up. And of course, don't smother the basal rosettes of any of your perennials. And finally, leaves can be used as the brown or carbon component in compost. Do we have any final questions, particularly on summer or fall, or any others that have come to the chat box for the whole presentation? Elaine, one person was confused about when to deadhead and when to leave the seed heads. They seem kind of in conflict, those two strategies. Okay, the deadheading is something that you could be doing throughout the summer, and particularly if you want to encourage that, that re-bloom. If you check on the chart that I provide and you find out that this plant will not be re-blooming, that would be when you would decide to keep the seed head. Um, is it okay to leave leaves covering your perennial plants? Well, as I mentioned, you don't want them to cover any basal rosettes. So the plants that I showed in that one example, like the sun drops, the lyre leaf sage, the lobelia plants, cardinal flower, and uh, great blue lobelia have rosettes, and they will rot away if the leaves cover those. So you want to make sure to uh, pull the leaves uh, away from them. And you definitely don't want to be having six or eight inches deep of leaves, just, just a couple of, of inches deep. Now, some people will actually reduce the amount of leaves that they uh, collect. They let the leaves just pile up as natural leaf litter in their forested areas. And they may perhaps shred the leaves that they would then put under their perennials. So they wouldn't be as thick there. Do you need to buy soil for planting? And if so, what kind would you get? As much as possible, use the natural soil that you have in your garden. I don't have a link to this, but our extension agent, Kirsten Conrad, has an excellent talk that you can look for that has to do with maintaining the soil. And her way of referring to things is you want to feed the soil rather than feeding the plants so much with, with fertilizers, as I discussed earlier. One of the best things you can do for your soil is to add organic matter. When you do a soil test, the average amount of organic matter will be around 5%. 
when I did a soil test, it was about 7.9%. That's a very rich soil. So plants that when you look at their preferred soil conditions, if they say that they prefer rich humus soil, you'll want to, to plant those in areas that have that rich soil. Plants that prefer lean soil, like the grasses, maybe you don't want to have as much organic matter. But increasing the amount of organic matter in your soil improves the soil structure. It uh, allows more airflow, uh, oxygen in the soil. It uh, allows little channels where water can flow through. And uh, it actually improves both draining and retention of water. Do you have a recommendation on when the best time to mulch is? I would tend to do the mulching that I described here, just uh, letting your natural leaves be the mulch. If you don't have enough large trees that would give you the leaf mulch and you are bringing it in uh, purchased or maybe getting leaf mulch from your local jurisdiction, you could really do it if you wanted to get a fresh start. You, you could do that or replenish it in the spring as you're beginning to see exactly what's coming up. You've already perhaps done the dividing of plants and you mulch a little bit around the new ones. Do you treat big sturdy leaves like sweet bay magnolia the same as other leaves? As far as leaving the leaves, there's a very good discussion about this in that presentation on Leave the Leaves by Nina DeRosa. She explains that the nutrient content of different species of leaves varies. And some of the leaves like magnolia leaves, and I believe oak leaves as well, maybe break down a little more slowly. So she said that if you're concerned about them just taking a long time to break down, even in your compost piles, you might choose those to sh do the shredding and, and let some of the other species leaves uh, be your mulch. A follow-up to that shredding leaves, does that in fact damage insects, moths, or butterflies that are overwintering? Well, this is the question, and she goes into detail about this. You have to decide what your priorities are. That's why I just let the leaves uh, completely lie where they have landed in my forested areas. I'll rake them up. I have done a limited amount of shredding, but the shredding that I would do would be of the leaves that collected, that just blew. Uh, I don't have any lawn, but uh, if I did have a lawn, I would take them from there, uh, any that I didn't mow in. I would collect these leaves that blow in to other parts of the garden, and it wouldn't be as likely that the larva would have come there. For example, Doug Talmy describes how some of the larva will start to form. The caterpillars might be up in the trees and then they will fall down beneath the trees. So I will leave that leaf litter, but I might take the whole leaves that have blown elsewhere in my yard. I might shred those and that would be minimizing any damage to those insects that I mentioned. Elaine, I thought I saw the chat box blowing up with questions, but in fact, it's blowing up with many, many thank yous to you and comments about how this is the best presentation anyone's ever seen. So <laughs> I think you'll be very happy to read all the nice comments. And there are many, many, many. So thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. And I wish you all the best. Happy gardening in the seasons throughout the year. Uh, as Khalid mentioned, there will be a recording of this class available fairly soon on our website. I will answer any questions I wasn't able to respond to with an addendum document, and all the resources are available for you on our website. So happy gardening, one and all.